Hello, and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a part of the Agora Podcast Network. I'm your host, Heather Tusco. I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being more deeply in touch with our own humanity. This episode, and the next one I'm going to do next week, is thanks to Pen and Sword Press, who sent me an advanced copy of the new book on Cardinal Woolsey by Phil Roberts. It's the first of two parts this week and next week, like I said, because it's too much to cover in one episode. It's been a while since I've done an episode on Woolsey. I think it's been about 13 years. Um, So it was timely. And I'm glad to be able to read up on him properly again. So I will put a link to the book in the show notes at englandcast.com slash Woolsey. Before we get started, though, TudorCon. Unbelievably, you guys, time flies so fast. We are only 10 and a half months away from TudorCon 2023 because there's this black hole that just sinks with time. It, it's just the weirdest thing. Anyway, the thing I want to say is that now is the perfect time to get your ticket. Well, why is that, Heather? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's because right now the price is still at the super early bird price, though it won't be that low for long. It saves you $130 off the regular price. But also, you can sign up for the payment plan when you check out and spread the payments over up to 10 months, I think I think it is. So you can reserve your spot, start to make your plans to come to Lancaster, Pennsylvania next September 8th through 10th, 2023. We already have five speakers confirmed topics like calligraphy, Henry VIII's medical treatments, and fiber arts. This is your opportunity to spend three days with your fellow Tudor history lovers. Imagine hanging out with a group of other people who completely get your obsession, who share it, who make jokes with you about whether Anne of Cleves was the ugly one, and who killed the princes in the tower. Even if you don't know anyone and you're coming by yourself, we are maybe the friendliest group on the planet. There were so many people who said things to me last time about how they were maybe a little nervous about coming on their own because they didn't know anybody, but they made friends so quickly, so, so quickly. And you're going to quickly be surrounded by like all your new best friends. So go to englandcast.com slash TudorCon to get your tickets. If you want to take advantage of the payment plan, you choose shop pay as your payment option when you're checking out. Again, englandcast.com slash TudorCon will give you all the details. So Thomas Woolsey. It's interesting to think about the ways that he has been portrayed in the media throughout the years and how it's changed in the past few decades. Also, random trivia fact I learned, the George Cavendish biography of Woolsey was the very first biography published in the English language, period. That's pretty cool. Anyway, Cavendish wrote that Woolsey was most earnest and readiest among all the council to advance the king's only will and pleasure without any respect to the case. The king, therefore, perceived him to be a meet instrument for the accomplishment of his devised will and pleasure. Woolsey, he said, combined his desire to serve the king with a special gift of natural eloquence, with a filed tongue to pronounce the same, that he was able with the same to persuade and allure all men to his purpose. Woolsey orchestrated the field of cloth of gold. He did treaties galore. He managed the royal household. He had diplomatic relationships he managed. He reformed with a small r, not a large reform like Reformation, but the small r, the church. And with Thomas More and Bishop Fisher, he recognized that there was a need to reorganize the foundations and the colleges and the monastic life. If you actually want more detail on what England was like, the English church was like before the Reformation. A couple of years ago, when it was the 500th anniversary of the 95 Theses, I did a whole Reformation month, um, and I did several episodes on the Reformation in England, and I did one on what the medieval church was like before the Reformation. So I'll link to that too in, in, the, um, in the show notes if you want kind of the background of what it was like. Woolsey was also a major patron of the arts. He subsidized scholarships. He founded Cardinal College in Ipswich and Oxford. He built Hampton Court, where he entertained foreign leaders and ambassadors. 
Not bad for a boy who was born a butcher's son in Ipswich. I've been to Ipswich. I went to a concert at the Corn Exchange in Ipswich a long time ago. I don't have a lot of memories of Ipswich. I think I liked it. Anyway, that's off topic. So, speaking of being a butcher's son, Woolsey's father, Robert, wasn't a butcher the way we would recognize a butcher. He was actually a bit of a serial entrepreneur. He held cattle. He was also an innkeeper. In fact, he was often in court with complaints against him for ignoring health and safety and hygiene standards. Apparently, his, quote, ale and beer measures did not give the official ale taster satisfaction. Also, and I quote, he slaughtered his oxen without showing their skins in the marketplace. And he cast out offal into the highway where his pigs wandered about at large unattended. Nothing worse than unattended pigs in the highway. I live in Amish country now. (laughs) There are unattended pigs in the highway sometimes. Anyway, during the reign of the Yorkist kings, he welcomed in the women of ill repute who came into his inn as well. But Henry VII cracked down with some new regulations and Robert mended his ways. On his mother's side, Thomas Woolsey's uncle was a fellow called Edmund Dondi, who was more well-to-do. In fact, he had the means to build 15 almshouses. He was a wealthy merchant. He was a member of Parliament for Ipswich, and his granddaughter would become the first wife of Sir Nicholas Bacon, Lord Keeper of the Great Seal of England during Elizabeth I's reign. Thomas's relationship with Edmund Dondi inspired him to thinking that maybe he could also become someone important. And it's possible that his uncle actually helped to finance his schooling. The Ipswich that Woolsey was born into was already quite old. It received its royal charter in 1200 with a port and relationships with traders from around Europe and even beyond. There was a shrine at Ipswich called Our Lady of Grace that drew pilgrims from the very beginning thanks to the mixture of its architecture. And of course, like all shrines, there were many miracles that had that had taken place there. Henry VII's wife, Elizabeth of York, actually donated money to the shrine. Henry VIII visited with Catherine of Aragon. No one is exactly sure when the shrine was built, but it was probably around 1150. There was also a hospital in Ipswich, and there was an inn. So you had this thriving economy of pilgrims and all of the infrastructure that would be there, the services that would be there to support them, and this this shrine. The shrine, of course, would be destroyed under Cromwell's disillusion, but it had already been a tourist destination for generations by that point and may have had a profound effect on young Woolsey's decision to pursue a career in the church. Of course, Thomas Cromwell, who managed the disillusion, who was the godfather of the disillusion, started his career working for Thomas Woolsey. As readers of Wolf Hall will remember, Cromwell got into trouble and had to leave the country, going to Italy. When he came back to London around 1513, he pursued a career as a lawyer, and he caught Woolsey's attention. Woolsey then appointed him the Commissioner of Revenues and made him his official legal secretary. Cromwell would later become a member of Parliament and replace Woolsey as Henry VIII's primary secretary and manager of his affairs slash life. One of Cromwell's greatest achievements was in dissolving and destroying many of the religious relics and shrines, including those in Woolsey's Ipswich. Though it is possible that some of the more important statues from the shrine may have been rescued. Woolsey grew up, he studied in the Ipswich Grammar School, which had been founded around the same time as Eton and earlier than Harrow. In 1480, the school still didn't have its own schoolhouse, though by 1483, a patron called Richard Fellall provided a house facing the convent of the Blackfriars. He had been a student there himself, probably wanted to give back to the school that had provided his own education. So his will 
offered the house opposite the Friars Preachers in Ipswich to be used forever as a common schoolhouse and dwelling with a yard to the north for a convenient schoolmaster to be appointed by the Bishop of Norwich on the nomination of the current bailiffs of Ipswich. The masters will pay no rent, but receive the rents from other property in Witten and Brooks Hall. They will charge no fees for children born and living in Ipswich, unless the parents have incomes of 20 shillings per annum or goods worth over 20 pounds, and will keep the properties in good repair. And every morning at 6 a.m., the master will take the pupils to sing the Mass of Our Lady at the north altar of the Blackfriars Church. Of his time at the church, George Cavendish wrote of Wolsey, And being but a child, he was very apt to learning, by means whereof his parents or his good friends and masters conveyed him to the University of Oxford, where he prospered so in learning that he told me in his own person he was called the boy bachelor, for as much as he was made Bachelor of Arts at 15 years of age. So the saying apparently is that he got his BA degree at 15 years of age, but probably it's that he entered the college at 15, and that was a little bit of fudging on their part to make him seem more brilliant than he actually was. So in 1498, Wolsey was ordained a priest. He served at Modlin College School. He was also likely the bursar of Modlin College and master of the college school. By 1501, he had risen. He was the master of the school and the dean of divinity. He had taught the sons of the first Marquis of Dorset, and through that connection, he became the rector of St. Mary's Church in Somerset, receiving an income of 21 pounds per year. Within a few years, he was the chaplain to a new patron, Sir Richard Nanfen, who was the king's governor in Calais. And this is where Wolsey's administrative acumen came to shine first. Apparently, when his patron was away, he would leave charge of everything to Wolsey. So Wolsey was just responsible for everything. And then perhaps recommended by Nanfan after his death, he moved to the court and he became the chaplain to Henry VII. So you see this kind of history of him going up through the clerical ranks while also starting to make an impression on important people who can help him rise. At the time, the keeper of the privy seal was a Bishop Richard Fox of Winchester. He was impressed with Wolsey, and he soon sent him to Scotland to investigate rumors that Scotland was planning an alliance with France. Then Wolsey was sent to the Low Countries to negotiate a marriage between Henry, who was a widower by now, with Margaret of Austria. That's Henry VII. He concluded with a diplomatic embassy to Emperor Maximilian that won him praise and trust all round. And by February of 1509, he became the Dean of Lincoln. But it was under Henry's son, Henry VIII, that Wolsey rose so quickly. Henry VIII trusted Wolsey, and he had no interest in dealing with the administrative side of running the country. Wolsey bucked the opinions of his other counselors early on and approved of Henry's desire to go to war with France, which was an early success of Henry's. And that became a success for Wolsey too. By 1511, Wolsey had a seat on the Privy Council, and Henry trusted him with more and more responsibilities. Wolsey would continue to rise, adding offices to the Bishop of Lincoln and Archbishop of York to his resume. During this time, Wolsey had a romantic relationship with Joan Lark from Thetford. It wasn't uncommon for members of the church to have a relationship despite their vows of celibacy, and he had a son with Joan called Thomas Winter. Years later, Anne Boleyn, when she was queen, would write Thomas a letter, and in that letter she asked him to think of her as a friend. But ultimately, it was Thomas Cromwell who would take care of him and was the truest friend to him. In 1511, they also had a daughter, Dorothy. Dorothy joined the church, and Cromwell actually personally provided her pension when her convent was dissolved. Wolsey also served as the guardian to several noble children. He would get money for doing that, of course. The most notable was Henry Percy. Henry Percy apparently fell in love with Anne Boleyn during this time that he was living in Wolsey's household, which was when he entered that potentially fatal pre-contract. 
By 1515, Wolsey was reaching the height of his career. He was becoming Lord Chancellor, the highest legal office in the government, as well as being the king's most important counselor. Henry also made a few attempts to have Wolsey elected Pope, and Wolsey had the supreme power over the English church. As the head of the church, Henry had plans to reorganize the English system. As the head of the church, Wolsey had plans to reorganize the English system, which created many enemies for him. For example, in 1528, he secured two papal bulls for renewal of English monastic life by suppressing all religious houses with fewer than six occupants and uniting greater houses with fewer than 12. Wolsey was on the road to revolutionizing the way the church and the monastic life in England was. But of course, he never got there because the Reformation happened. But it's interesting to think about what the church might have been like if the Reformation hadn't ever happened. Also, random fact about Wolsey, he never instigated burning a heretic. He was apparently known as being fairly lenient on heresy, unlike Thomas More and some of the other churchmen of his time. As the first minister, the Venetian ambassador, Sebastian Guistinian, said that Wolsey had a vast ability and that he was learned, extremely eloquent, and indefatigable. When things looked bleak for Wolsey, for example, when he was negotiating with the French in 1527, Cavendish wrote that the next morning after the conflict, he rose early in the morning, about four of the clock, sitting down to write letters into England onto the king commanding one of his chaplains to prepare him to mass, insomuch that his said chaplain stood revested, that means ready in his vestments, until four of the clock at afternoon, all which season my lord never rose once to piss, nor yet to eat any meat, but continually wrote his letters with his own hands, having all that time his nightcap and kerchief on his head. So he was a workaholic. He was the kind of person who could see what needed to be done, and then he could get that done. And in the next installment next week, we're going to dig deeper into his relationship with Henry and his fall. So if you want to read more, you can grab the book from Phil Roberts. I'm going to add the link in the show notes again at englandcast.com slash Woolsey. But we're going to leave it there for this week. You can hop in the Tudor Learning Circle, tutorlearningcircle.com, which is the social network just for Tudor nerds to discuss this and all other things Tudor. And you can grab your TudorCon ticket at englandcast.com slash TudorCon and plan your trip to commune with your fellow Tudor history lovers in September 2023. Thanks so much for listening. I will be back again soon. Talk to you later. Bye. Blow northern wind, a sandful may be sweating.